bum 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 bum
these little self-contained stories mm. that connect together in a much larger, more expansive way. It's going to kick off on Free Comic Book Day, May 7th, with a Bone Orchard Mythos prelude before jumping into an original graphic novel, The Passageway, on June 21st. And then later in the year, we're going to get a miniseries, 10,000 Black Feathers. Lisa and I have had the chance to read The Passageway, and it very much deals in that same kind of dread that Gideon Falls explored. It's the same kind of psychological horror where the main character is going like, is this really happening or am I just truly losing grip with my reality? And you, the reader, also kind of feel that too. You know, you've been reading uh, Clay McLeod Chapman's novel, Whisper Down the Lane, mm -hmm. and something you said about that to me really struck me where as you were reading it, as and as it was wrapping up, you were like, am I okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Has this book infected me? And Lemire and Sorrentino's comics have that quality where they kind of poison your soul as you're reading them. I refer to it in the interview as like dream logic, mm. where when, and I've been having like wild nightmares as of late, um, cause I, I have sleep issues and, um, and it, you have that feeling when you're inside a dream that it is just so utterly true, even though it makes zero sense. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And that is what the passageway made me feel. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and this interview doesn't spoil anything about the passageway. We talk a little bit about the general premise, which is about this young man named John who travels to an island with a lighthouse on it and meets Sally. And there is a sinkhole that has appeared on this island, and he's a geologist set to explore it. Talking about things getting in your head and throwing you off of your equilibrium, everything did not go as <laughs> planned <laughs> right, right. for this interview. Um, of course, Andrea Sorrentino is across the world in a completely different time zone. So there was a little confusion about the actual start time of this right, interview. Right, right, right. And he presumed that we're cool L.A. people, which we are not. Um, <laughs> so, like, um, right before we started the interview, we had Jeff Lemire there, like, uh, going like, I'll email Andrea just to see where he's at. And like, and he's like, but let's start. Yeah. And I am not a person who does well with <laughs> surprises. Like I had, like, I was really stressed about like, okay, make sure that I have equal number of questions for writer and artist. And, and I have my little, my little template with all my questions and all of my preparation. And then curveball and Lisa panic but it, it, I think it all worked out. Oh, for the best. I think it worked out great. But I understand the panic too, especially since this is such a rare opportunity to have both Lemire and Sorrentino. Like Lemire even told us he hasn't spoken to him in a you know quite a long time, and they do most of their communication via email, which we eventually get into that process side of things. But knowing that it's a reunion of sorts, like we recognize how special it is. So when Andrea wasn't there, we were getting like, oh no, are we losing our special interview? But luckily Andrea showed up just in time, just when I got to the question of like, okay, Jeff Lemire, is there a God? Is there a God? Oh, Andrea, we're so happy you're here. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so I also think that that little time delay got us a little more time with the two of them. So this is a nice extra long conversation with Jeff Lemire and Andrea Sorrentino. Let's get into it. Oh, that's you telling me to shut up and let's just get into the actual interview? Well, that's what the people are here for. All right, let's do it. <laughs> Jeff, thank you so much for joining us here at Comic Book Couples Counseling. Welcome to the Love Nest. Thanks. It's great to be here. Uh, we are crazy excited about the Bone Orchid Mythos. Another collaboration with Andrea Sorrentino, uh, just coming off of Primordial. And I think where I wanted to start this conversation is... Why is this the time to really expand on that collaborative re relationship and build something that seems like it's going to stick around for a long time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think it's the culmination of all the stuff we've done. You know, it's we started working together. It's a decade now that we've been working together, which we just kind of realized. I think we came on Green Arrow at DC around 2012. So, and that was... Um, 
right away we just had this weird chemistry that you don't often find where um we each had a voice but together we had a third voice that it was you know it, it was like this this great thing that um just weird uh creative directions and mistakes and things would would pop up and we'd just embrace them and, and turn it into something more you know and it, that doesn't always happen um it's not so effortless but with us it was and we you know started forming a friendship and this this cool collaboration we did some stuff at marvel after that and then decided while we were working on the wolverine stuff at marvel we kind of started talking let's do something that we own ourselves and created ourselves you know we we seem to have like a good thing going here and and Gideon Falls came out of that and Gideon was um it just it was one of those weirdly effortless projects where despite being a very complex story and universe in, in itself um it all just kind of flowed out you know and I would I would send Andrea ideas or scripts and he would expand on them and go off in different directions and that would and I would take the ball from him and go you know it just kind of built and built and this sort of it's, it's what you dream collaborations can be, where it's just this effortless flow of ideas that we're kind of one-upping each other and, and, and feeding off each other's sort of, um, you know. And so when we were winding down Gideon, um, there was a little period of, well, what do we do next? And, you know, Primordial was always meant to be a one-off, just almost a palate cleanser from Gideon, where let's, let's try sci-fi. It's so different from the horror stuff we were doing and tell this heartfelt sci-fi story. Um, and doing that, it was like, okay, now what? Because <laughs> it was always it's always the next thing because we want to keep working together. And it was Andrea who, I think it was, this one really sprung from him more than me, you know, um, which is kind of the opposite of how, th like Gideon and Primordial really came from ideas I had that I brought to him, you know? And uh, this one was almost the other way around where he started emailing me saying, you know, he wanted to do, he wanted to do horror, he wanted to do darker stories. and he had this idea to do, create something really big and expansive sort of like a lovecraftian mythos you know where you could tell individual stories that stand alone but they all kind of share a same the a same mythology underneath it all that we can build as well and and um it was his idea to do different mini series different graphic novels that all kind of connect in different ways and uh it was kind of daunting at first and um i'm, I'm so busy it was so busy with other things and I was trying to finish Primordial. I still hadn't written all that. And I was kind of like, I can't process <laughs> that right yet, you know? But then as I as I wound up Primordial, I started to see the potential in it. And and we just started, continue to sort of just build from his initial emails of what this thing could be. And, and we went down some roads of like, well, how connected do the stories have to be? You know, do we have the same characters in different books or not? And, you know, these kind of questions we started asking each other and kind of running through the options. And well, if we did that, then that would mean this so and you know and it kind of just grew out of these just back and forth over the last um i guess we probably really started doing that uh probably almost a year ago where these kind of this world building sort of back and forth <laughs> started happening and it just sort of grew and grew and then we kind of landed on the, where we are now with the shape of the thing and the, how the mythology would tie in and all the big picture things we kind of uh nailed those down and, and now we're into the specifics of the uh each story, you know, and that's the fun part. One thing I feel like you two have mastered as a collaborative pair is like the evocation of this uneasy feeling of like dream logic where like, you know, it's all connected, but somehow like it reminds us of this ten tentative connection to reality. What brings you back to dream logic in so many stories? It's always this dance with stuff. And when, when a lot of my stuff gets built around some sort of a mystery, you know, because I think it's just like a compelling way into a story. And, uh, and when in, around, you know, I'm trying to explain it. It's, we have these mysteries or these stories or these mythologies that we build together. Um, and then it's always a bit of a dance of, we kind of know the whole story, but even though we know the whole story in a linear fashion, fashion, you know, it's like, well, okay, now how do we present it in a way that still doesn't give everything, but gives enough for the reader readers to to intuit what's going on, but still ask questions and still interpret some of it themselves, you know. And I, those are the best, my favorite kinds of stories personally to read. The stuff that doesn't just give it to you all, you, you know, you have to uh, you have to do some work as a reader and you have to engage with the story. 
You know, I, I love that. You know, I love David Lynch, obviously. Anyone who follows me yeah. knows the love of Lynch. And he did, he's the master at this, of, of building these mysterious worlds where the pieces are there, but not all the pieces. And, you, and, the, and the viewer is left to kind of interpret and fill things in. And I just love that engagement with the audience. And, um, but it's, you know, it's, it's, you have to be careful. You don't want to give them too little that they feel cheated, like we don't know what's going on. We, we, they have to feel confident that we know where we're going and we know what the story is, even if they're not getting the whole picture. And so we do a lot of work, even on this, the Bone Orchard, where the last several months have just been laying down this intricate mythology that will be underneath the books. And how much of that actually gets into the books, we don't know yet, you know, but it's mm. all there for us to pick from and just drop things in uh, when it feels right. And a lot of it's just instinct too. It's not, you know, you just, okay, this story, I'm going to, I'm going to show this little piece of the puzzle, uh, but not show this part. And, and um, yeah, I guess, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I just like creating these things that uh, promote like viewer or reader engagement, you know, more. And, and it's so easy just to, to give, give the whole story and have someone read it and then forget about it. But <laughs> I think what it brings people coming back to Gideon is that it's almost all there, but there are some pieces missing that we've, leave things very mysterious in a good way where you, you want to keep trying to figure it out. Um, and I, I love that. Well, the, the passageway is about a geologist looking into a sinkhole. And I think that a sinkhole is a great starting place for a mythos because it reminds us that like our very existence every day uh, relies on us taking certain things for granted. Like uh, the ground is solid. It's not just going to like open up and like suck me down. Like it's fine. But like, John, as a scientist, is like, it, 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 he has to ask questions and he, he doesn't get to take things for granted. And so like starting with a sinkhole, like what does that metaphor mean to you? And do you ever find yourself when you're creating a story like in a, like a, a logical like sinkhole place? <laughs> um, you know, the, the passageway is a funny one for me. We, we had built this this world we wanted to tell stories in, in this mythology, but I didn't really have the idea for the passageway until it was this past summer. I'm like, uh, we were going to start working on the books, like actually start writing and drawing them, you know, and, and we had a different story that was going to be first. Uh, and for some reason, it just was not clicking for me. Uh, mm. I, I, just, I started writing it a couple times and it just felt, I don't know. It just was not feeling right. Uh, and I got frustrated and Andrea and I kind of, had some emails about that and him just sort of encouraging me just to write just write what I want you know just write something cool it'll be we'll make it good or whatever so I, this whole passageway story really came I, I literally came up with the idea and wrote the whole script in about a week <laughs> <laughs> this summer you know it was very very from the gut you know and so in terms of what my intentions were with it I don't know I can look at it now like you and, and see what what does this this sinkhole this thing mean you know but I think it did a couple things uh the, un the unstableness of our present day reality. I think we're all feeling that, you know, with the way we had the pandemic and now, you know, with all the all sort of stressful things going on globally and everything. It just feels like the things we did take for granted in our day-to-day -day lives in the, over the last couple of years have been really shaken where what's gonna happen next? You know, I think a lot of people are feeling that. It, it's very unsteady and scary time, you know? and. And, and that certainly echoes what happens in this story with John, who's this man who, like you say, he's a man of science and, and fact and geology and, you know, things happened in a certain way. And this is the history of rocks and minerals that he knows. And, and this doesn't really make sense what he's seeing. And it kind of opens his mind or, or maybe caves his mind in. <laughs> I want to read the story, but... It, but and then, of course, just taking all that aside, it just seemed like such it's kind of an obvious, but perfect metaphor of this person having to pass through something into this new world, just like the readers, you know, and um, so it was it was kind of I just wanted something that felt standalone and, and uh, evocative, but opened the door to what we want to do next. I think what uh, I love so much about your work, uh, and especially in stories like Gideon Falls and The Passageway, and I would say David Lynch stories too, is that while the, for lack of a better word, the supernatural element is intriguing and you want to know more, really what 
serves as the spine to the stories is like an emotional, very human pain. And like John is holding on to something in his past that is causing him as much pain as whatever supernatural thing he's going to encounter in the passageway. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's, I've always, that's always been the sort of, for me as a storyteller, the thing I hook into first is some simple emotional story, you know, and, um, and all these, I guess I, ha- I hesitated a little to do horror stuff like this in a big way, because I feel like a lot of horror stories don't do that. They rely on like a high concept or, you know, um, the atmosphere and the horror stuff kind of takes over. And I really, what I'm more concerned with is telling really human grounded emotional stories. And if I can then do that and take horror stuff and use that to enhance those stories or reflect them or shine a mirror on them, that's that's what I want to do. So that was, you know, yeah, I mean, it's always got to stem from some, some really character driven thing for me to make these stories work or feel resonant. And then the horror feels worse too, because you get yeah. to really connect with these characters and understand their pain and, or, you know, in this case, John's past and how it's sort of this thing that's haunted him and uh, kind of releases him at the end of the story in some ways. And as like a reader, these stories, especially in our uncertain times, uh, can fulfill some kind of need. Like it, like they might not like uh, solve all our problems, but they allow us to look inward and contemplate the horrors of our own daily existence. And I wonder as a creator, as the person that is building this story and this kind of metaphorical um, solve uh, for the reader, like, do, do you gain yourself some kind of respite in the creation from the outside? Form? Yeah, for sure. I think there definitely is that thing where all this anxiety and fear that we all feel at different times in our lives and I'm no different in the last few years, especially if it's kind of all been enhanced a bit, you know, and um, you carry that stuff around and it's not healthy and you got to, find creative outlets for it you know so for me doing these darker stories like the bone orchard it does provide sort of a conduit for me to get this stuff out on paper like i said i wrote the passage really quick it was almost like it just kind of flowed out you know i I guess i had something in there i wanted to get out and uh, and you kind of get it out and and it lets you move on and not hold that stuff so much so i hopefully that's okay these stories can provide that for the reader as well you know uh because uh you know I, i feel like um my least favorite kind of horror is the really sort of i guess stuff that's just relies on on gore and uh sort of this narcissistic kind of worldview you know and and i'm not really interested in that i mean the stories can have gore and they can be scary they can whatever but to me they have to either they have to tell a real story and they have to have some purpose and um and they and and they should provide a release for the for the readers like they do with me some somewhere to go and get those dark thoughts out and and kind of focus them on something else <laughs> other than internally you know as brad mentioned a lot of your main characters do have this connection to tragedy and john has this like senseless tragedy of his past but for for your characters like a connection to tragedy is almost like a superpower because it creates this curiosity that kind of has you honing in on uh, on whatever the mystery is. It takes you into this like parallel realm, you know, where the the, the rest of us are just, we're, we're not there because we're not curious. We don't have like that terrier thing of like wanting to resolve something. Do you feel like having a connection to senseless tragedy makes you like more susceptible to mystery? Uh, that's, I don't know. That's a good question. I, I mean, um, I think in the case of, passageway certainly and Gideon Falls you have these characters that are that do have these sort of uh, I guess tragedies in their past and 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 these they're kind of broken people you know and um, looking for things and these dark mysteries kind of present themselves both in the passageway and with Gideon I think as well and um, and maybe the thing that these people are missing they start to look for in the darkness, you know, and then they they end up finding something else. But um, so, yeah, I think it's, I think tragedy is is another way to 
it's another key to open a door into kind of self-examination and, and searching for meaning, you know, uh, in the world for why the, why certain things have happened to you or why, you know, what's the point of our existence, you know, if we get right down to it and, and, uh, and that leads these people to be maybe more susceptible yeah, to these, these dark kind of pathways that we, <laughs> Andre and I create and, and these mysteries, you know, and even, and you, I don't want to spoil the book, but you know, in uh, the passage where you see that with John, where he has this thing in his past that's sort of, even if he wasn't always conscious of it, it's always been this little pit of darkness inside him, you know, and uh, and then as he goes through the passageway, it gets pulled forward. And um, I think we, well, I don't want to spoil I, I'm going to say yeah, 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 yeah. about the ending of the book that I don't want to yet. So It surprises me that you say like, you are like a little nervous to like wade into the horror realm because to me, like starting with a scientist is like a great like intu intuition for for a place of like horror, because in horror, scientists are treated like one of two ways, like either they uh, they're treated with reverence because they're like answer seeking individuals, but also like so a lot of the times they're dismissed because they're arrogant enough to think that reality can be measured. And I feel like John, by being connected to tragedy, but also being a scientist, gives him a distinct advantage in a in a horror mythos universe. Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't, you know, I, I for me, his him being a scientist was like much like with like Norton and Gideon Falls or um, Father Fred. You know, they, Norton had his sort of work. It wasn't really science, but to him, it was a science. His collecting and cataloging, and and Fred had his faith. And then John has, like you say, science, you know, these, this sort of bedrock that this, this, the way things are, you know, that they kind of believe in. And it's, it's quickly sort of, it's, it's, uh, for John, the science is sort of a gateway into something bigger than science. And just like it was for Fred and Norton, you know, this, these belief systems they have get them so far and then they kind of fall away. And it's just, the, reveals the tip of a bigger iceberg, I think, for them. So, you know, the passageway, the way it works for the bone orchid is like a, a, a tease. You know, you, you get to the end and you want, you want to spill out into the next series immediately. Um, and knowing that the passageway was not necessarily the first entry in this mythos, I'm curious about knowing the best way to ease an audience into something that you're promising is going to be massive and unlike anything else you've given us before. Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, and there's no science to it. You know, we have, we have, Andrea and I have spent a few months now back and forth building a, a mythology, a, a story, you know, that we feel really good about and are excited about it's, and it's, and we know what it is, you know, we, we have this document that we pass back and forth and it's in two sections. There's like one first section is the stuff only Andre and I will ever see. And that's like mm -hmm. the whole story told, you know, in, in pretty much linear fashion, fashion. Interesting. Uh, and then we have the second section is what's been, what's going to be shown in the books when, and, you know, so we're, we are, it's very much plotted and planned out in a, but then you get, sometimes we'll start writing or drawing a, a scene or a whatever in one of these books and it just feels right to show something else that we hadn't quite planned yet <laughs> andrea will do it he'll throw stuff in visually that i we hadn't discussed and it's like okay that's that's you know let's make that thing known and so i think for, there's no you know there's no science to it like i said but i think the important thing is that um we're not giving too much too soon because we want to keep engaged you know and to keep mm. this, the readers engaged and and, and guessing and, and building with them uh but you do want to give people enough each time that they feel like we're not treading water that we are progressing and that they're learning more uh so that's that's the fine balance and then i think the for us it's been like well let's throw this in and then we'll see it or, or whatever and we can pull back you know it's before before we finish the book. So um, it's good to have it all worked out between us. And then, like I said, we kind of can pick and choose when and how we show things. But another big aspect we'll play with is time as well. So it might not all be revealed in chronological order as well, which will be fun. <laughs> so we'll just, I'll just leave that as a teaser. Okay, okay. 
I love the idea of this document of the unknowable, like, like you're creating this structure, like a skeleton, but we're never intended to see it because there's going to be all the fleshy bits on, on top of it. Do you believe in the unknowable, like as an individual, like is the unknowable something you think about all of the time? Um, I don't know if I think about it all the time, but I certainly the stories that have always struck me the hardest and stuck with me the longest are the ones that have a sense of awe and wonder and mystery that aren't quite fully knowable. You know, um, in sci-fi, it's definitely 2001, A Space Odyssey, where that, that ha- it captures that feeling more than I think any other film I've seen, the sense of wonder and awe and the unknown. And, um, and so th- that's one since I was young that's always been a favorite and stuck with me and it's been sort of a a touchstone for me in storytelling and then of Mm. course I said earlier this David Lynch at his best does that like no one where he has these mysteries these worlds he built and we don't get all the pieces uh and there's something you can almost intuit what he's saying but it's just like you're seeing it right out of the corner of your eye and when you turn to look at what it really is it's gone you know and I, I love that kind of storytelling in terms of you know in my real life and whatnot I don't I don't think about that kind of big stuff too much on a personal level. You know, I'm too busy working and <laughs> putting it into stories. So I don't, maybe if I didn't put it into the stories, I'd think about it more, you know what I mean? As it relates to me, but I, I'm <laughs> like with anything, the stuff you get it down on paper and then you don't have to carry it around so much during and, your day of life. So. Andrea is coming in right oh, now. No. Perfect. Hey, everyone. Hey, Hello. Andrea. How are you? Hey. There he is. Sorry Welcome for to the party. Sleep. No, that's okay. We we appreciate you here, and we're excited to have the two of you in one room. Uh, it's 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 been a while. One Zoom room. Yes. Yeah. We we also don't usually have too many calls. Just me and Jeff. So this is some kind of an event in some way. Yeah. Well, so we were just talking about how the passageway kind of explores the unknowable, and Jeff was mentioning how this book sort of stemmed from your desire to build a mythos, to build a larger story. And I'm wondering if you could speak to your inspiration in plunging into something so large. Well, I think it started because uh, Jeff and I wanted to do something like, um, we wanted to focus on smaller stories so we could keep our creativity, uh, be pushed at every every new stories because we will work on new characters new settings and we wouldn't have to just stay on one single big story so we started with this idea and we wanted to do many horror stories uh, many superior horror stories then i started to think that if it would have been nice to put all these stories in one single big universe and starting to find some connections between stories. And so we started to talk about this idea and Jeff also liked it. So we started to create this kind of big mythology in behind those stories. And we had a lot of back and forth emails where we started to uh, underline all the, um, uh, to, to take all the elements or the ideas that we had and put together and we created this big um, mythos behind those stories. And I think the more that we, we start uh, talking about the new stories, the more we understand how we can put all these elements together and uh, we can make them work uh, with the, the big uh, backstory that we created for it. Uh, Jeff was mentioning how you guys have really mapped this out in a lot of ways. And when I look at your art, it does feel like there is a long thought process. Like it, you do uh, spend a good amount of time uh, considering the sequential side of things, uh, the sequential storytelling. Can you... Talk a little bit about that and your process of planning so far ahead. Yeah, I think it, uh, it's two different things. I mean, there is one thing that is planning uh, uh, long ahead. I mean, like uh, it's something I is, I've done with Jeff in these weeks where we talk about what we want to do with the mythos in general. And then there is my process on the way that I, uh, that I work on single sequences 
that is a bit different. It's something very personal. I mean, I usually just read the sequence on the, the way that Jeff writes it on the scripts. And I take some, maybe some days far from the, the pages just to think uh, about the best way to put this sequence on, uh, on the page. And especially in the works that we did on image, for instance, I add some pages of some panels to the, to the sequence so that I can make it the best way that, in the way that I think is the best for me. So I'm just working now in, on a sequence in uh, 10,000 Black Feeders, the first issue I'm working now. And I took this sequence that was uh, like four pages and I took it to eight pages. So uh, because I started to, to think at the best way, I wanted to, to put what Jeff has written on the script on, on the page. So yeah, I take sometimes uh, far from the pages. So maybe two, three years to uh, try to understand the best. And then I go to uh, on work and I already know how I want to put all elements in sequence so that the, the, the whole sequence is the best as it can be. And for the two of you, like, does this feel like, you know, as epic as it seems to us as the reader? Like this feels like uh, a leveling up in your collaboration together, uh, as much as it is, is like a leveling up for our 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 love affair with you two as creators. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's it. Okay. It was just... You go first. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I just wanted to say that it's very exciting for me. Yeah. We, we got the feel that we are building something very huge. You know, it's not like the. Um, it, it's more or less what we did with Gideon Falls, but it's even bigger. Because uh, we we are using a lot of stories to tell one one single big story. Every story will be self-contained, so you don't need to read every other stories to understand what you are reading. But if you put all the pieces together, you will have a vision of something much bigger that spans through a much bigger time from probably the the origin of the species from the far future. And it's very exciting to work on this and to add some pieces uh, to with every stories to the big uh, big plan. Yeah, I think a lot of that comes from the more we work together, the more comfortable we get with each other, and the more we actually, the more we've. I feel like in the last couple of years, the more we've gotten to know each other as friends as well as artistic collaborators, and I think that that we have a trust with each other now and a commitment to each other to continue to create. And it, and once you have that, it really opens up the potential and the possibility of what you can do when you're not just thinking a year ahead, but we can, we know now that we, we love working together and we're probably in this for the long term. It allows you to sit back and, and plan bigger with confidence, knowing that we can actually pull it off, you know? And, um, so I think it comes from, from that comfort level. Jeff mentioned that it was your idea, Andrea, to go in a horror direction. And I, I want to know why, like why horror? Well, I'm very, uh, I'm very passionate for horror. I just have some kind of, uh, it's some kind of preference for this kind of uh, genre. So um, I think I, I've done several different things in the comic industries, like from superheroes to sci-fi to something like this. But I feel like when I'm back to horror, it's like I'm going back to my comfort zone in some way. It's just something I, I loved to read when I was a, a kid. I, I, I know it's a bit weird, but I grew up with some readings like the Bram Stoker's Dracula or the Lovecraft uh, tales and things like that. So it's just something that in some way I've grown up with. So it's, and I think it also works much better uh, with my style uh, to, and maybe I have done superheroes, but for sure my art style works better with horror for sure. So it's something I feel quite comfortable with. And if we had to start something so big and so planned with Jeff, I really wanted it to be something horror. And I think it will be something like, um, I talked with Jeff about it. It's more about, um, our personal kind of horror is not just uh, doing, um, I don't know, like splatter things right. or gore things and things like that. I, I recently say that it's more like an existential horror. It's some kind of horror that it's about uh, feels, about uh, solitude, about the isolation, 
uh, it's more about atmosphere than about uh, graphic horror. And I think this is actually the kind of horror I like and the kind of horror I like to put on pages. And I hope this will be shown in the uh, in the Born Orchard books. Oh, I mean, I, I you know, having read it, I feel like it's absolutely there. And I think like, you know, Jeff was talking about the inspirations of David Lynch on on the work a little bit, and then hearing the influence of Lovecraft from your side, a little Bram Stoker, like that marriage of tones really does come through in this and also in Gideon Falls. Yeah, I think we have different influences, probably, which is good. You know, I don't I don't know that Andrea is a huge Lynch fan like me, but that's OK. You know, I bring certain influences and he brings stuff that I'm not as familiar with. And in that's that's probably best that way that we have different different things to offer, you know, and um, and, you know, just speaking to what he said about horror, too, I think the the advantage that this project gives us is that each story we're doing so many different stories that they can all have, like, you know, some stories can maybe uh, have a feeling of science fiction in them. Or some stories can have a feeling of like a noir mystery. You know, you can, you can play with different calibrations of what horror is and, and we can not get stuck in one thing all the time. So we can still stretch out visually and into different genres a little bit here and there as well. One of the things that, that Andrea mentioned that has my imagination like going the most wild is the idea that each of you're creating stories that could also otherwise stand alone and could yeah. be read on their own. And it reminds me of like in the passageway, they're on this like tiny island, but this tiny, I like surrounded by water, but underneath the water, there is this like big connecting planet or universe. And um, Andrea, how do you feel introducing the mythos with the passageway specifically as the opening. I think we we talked a bit about um, uh, which had to be the first uh, Bone Orchard book. I think probably we wanted to make it Tenement as the first book. Then we switched the idea with the passageway. And I like the idea that the passageway has uh, some kind of meaning in its title that is like a passageway for the readers uh, to, to get to the Bone Orchard mythos. So it's, um, and I think in some way, also the way it's written is the best story to start introducing people into the mythos because it's a um, um, dreaded story. It's a dark story. It's a self-contained story, but it also gives some glimpse to what is coming next. Uh, I'm, I'm not spoiling anything, but you will see at one point something that will give you an idea of, of what's it, or what you could find in future books. And I think this makes the passageway like the perfect book to start reading the Bonocher. Of course, you can start with other books if you want, but uh, we we talk about it and we think that this is the, the best book you can start with. So you guys have been working together for so long. So undoubtedly, you guys have influenced each other. And I'm just wondering, like, what's a lesson that you each learned from the other person that you have now made part of your creative process or being? Oh, boy. <laughs> Jeff. Um, well... I think for me, it, it probably goes back a bit further than Bone Orchard. You know, when we first started working together in um, 2012 on Green Arrow, and I saw the way that Andrea worked and uh, how inventive and imaginative he was with his layouts and with um, taking things in my scripts and kind of expanding. Like, you know, how he mentioned earlier, there was a four page sequence, he turns it into an eight an eight page sequence because that's how he sees for him the best the best way to illustrate that and so early on seeing that he can do that and how and how well he does that it, it allowed me as a writer to um, back off a little bit you know and not try to control the visuals as much or not try to control the layouts in my scripts and just give the artist freedom to to do what they do because that's how you get the best work out of any artist. But especially with Andrea, you know, he's going to be always additive. He's not going to misinterpret what I'm doing. He's going to add to it. And that's a very rare, I've never really had that in collaboration before in the same degree where I give an idea and he takes that idea and expands on it and gives it back to me. And then I have to expand on it. It's almost like passing, passing something back and forth and it gets bigger each time we do it. And I, I don't know if that answers your question, but that was... Yeah. 
me a revelation and uh it's still the thing that excites me the most about working with him and even knowing that we have this mythology worked out i know it's going to keep <laughs> growing and evolving and changing you know from what just we're happy with what we have now and i know that that's only going to get bigger and better the more we pass it back and forth and that's 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 what you hope every collaboration could be you know that kind of exhilarating you're not sure what the person's going to deliver but you know it's going to be better than what you had in mind and that's that's a great a great way to it's it's a it's a great situation for me knowing having a faith in someone like that to to be able to work with him and and build these things yeah i think something for me changed while we were working on green arrow there is a sequence in uh, where oliver is like um, he's taking some drugs something like that and he's starting having some hallucination about the island and things like that and i clearly remember that uh, before that point i was still a bit um, unsure if I could do something really crazy about the, the script that Jeff were giving me, because we didn't know each other too well. I remember I started doing something completely different, completely crazy from the script. And I remember I sent the pages and I said, okay, this is the way I will do the page. If you want, I can redraw the page starting from, from scratch, if you don't like, but this is the way I would like to do it. And I was a bit uh, hesitant because I didn't know the reaction that Jeff or the editor would have about it. But I clearly remember that Jeff sent me an email and said something like, um, don't ever be afraid to change things from the script. Do whatever you want. Please do whatever you want because I like it. And I think that moment completely changed the way we work it together because I understood that I could do whatever I wanted. And even in my mind, even in my mind, it was like something was unlocked. So something was, um, I, I completely freed myself. I felt completely free. And I think this kind of respect we have of each other is the key of our collaboration because I know that I can, I am free to do whatever I want. So I don't have to work in some way, like I'm, I'm locked in uh, to some rules or things like that. Hmm. I, was, I also think another thing that really works uh, between us is that um, many of the stories that Jeff tells are very psychological. They, they are about uh, the um, uh, dreams or things like that, that really allows me to, to work in some very creative way that I couldn't do with some maybe more realistic or completely realistic story. So it's also about what we tell in our stories that give me the chance to work on something completely different or completely crazy. Well, we feel like incredibly privileged to have the both of you in our Zoom meeting together, uh, knowing that you guys don't often have the opportunity to see each other face to face when you are constructing your comics. And I just, I, you know, can you give us a little insight into this process of uh, communication that you two have and how you find confidence even in that form of like via email? Uh, I just, I think we just, we never really spoke on the phone right from the start. So it was always email. So it just sort of became easy for us to communicate and be honest with each other. There are, there've been many times where we've emailed each other with things we weren't, we were uncertain about or not feeling good about. And the other one, you know, it, it's a very honest relationship we've developed where uh, we trust each other's opinions. And um, so even though it's email, it feels very personal to me whenever I write Andrea, it feels sometimes more more intimate than a phone call because I feel like sometimes you can be more honest when you write things down mm -hmm. and you have that you know you're not struggling with your words like I am right now you know <laughs> uh yeah it, it's always felt very very personal very very direct the connection you know even at DC we would talk I was away from the editors you know just just one-on-one -on -one. and um and then of course at image that's what it is you know we don't really have editors or or a publisher to worry about so much it's it's really our world and our creation so it's a very direct back and forth and yeah we i we probably email almost every day about something most mm -hmm. of the time and um and pass the with this book it's been really fun it's the first time we've really been world building together like right from the start you know it's usually with gideon or primordial i kind of had at least a some of the idea worked out before i presented it to andrea or this time we were kind of from the ground 
just both creating it together and passing it back and forth. And that's been really fun, you know? Um, and yeah, email hasn't been prohibitive at all for us. It just seems, it seems to work. Yeah. I also got this thing that I'm not too sure about my spoken English. So I always feel like uh, I'm better at giving my opinions by writing because maybe if we would have a call, maybe I wouldn't be able to explain too well my ideas. So I usually prefer to, to write them via email so I can have a bit, uh, um, a bit a better comfort on what I'm writing. So I think we started developing this because I wasn't so sure about the way I, I speak English. And in some way, it becomes some, a very good way of uh, dealing to each other. Because as Jeff said, we are very direct in the way we speak about things. And I think we also mostly trust each other, so we don't need to really talk too much about the way we do things or things like that. I will just send pages and, and, and it's okay. We don't have to, to talk too much about it. Yeah, we don't get into the page by page, scene by scene. Like we don't discuss the detail of how he's going to draw something or what. You know, like we, we talk about the big, the big mythology stuff and the big direction and overall sort of whatever for the book but once i hand him the script it, he really has that complete freedom to interpret it however he wants we don't we don't discuss each scene and how he's going to draw it or anything beforehand it's just you know i have faith in obviously at this point he, he's going to do something amazing anyway so i just let him go and and like you said it's better for him to have that freedom i i think that comes from the fact that i draw myself i think i i can understand the mindset of the artist maybe a bit more than a lot of comic book writers who don't do that, you know, and I understand the importance of having that freedom to, to try things and not, not feel like someone's over your shoulder watching how you're doing it or wanting you to do it a certain way. It's very important. So um, I give, I try to give him that as much as I can. Well, uh, whatever you guys are doing uh, is perfect. Keep doing it. It's don't amazing. Stop. Uh, you know, we were not Green Arrow fans. And then like our comic dealer gave us your Green Arrow those many years ago. And uh, we've been with you two as creators since. And it's so exciting whenever a new project comes out. And this one just feels like, like I said, it feels next level for us. And so we're very, very excited. Uh, we'll have links in the show notes to uh, where people can find you, uh, sub stacks and socials and whatnot. But just in case those people don't read those show notes that I work so hard on, <laughs> uh, can you let our listeners know where they can continue this conversation with you guys online? Yeah, well, there's a few things. I think Andrea and I are both pretty active on Instagram, promoting the stuff and sharing work and uh a little bit on Twitter, but a little bit less lately. I find Twitter is getting harder and harder to, <laughs> to do things on. But, uh, and then I have a Substack newsletter where we'll be, con we'll, we'll continue to preview and tease Bone Orchard stuff, I think, as we do it. And, and then the big thing is the free comic book day in May. I guess it's in May. We have yeah. a little Bone Orchard prelude that will be going out to comic shops free to anyone over 18 because it's obviously pretty adult, scary stuff. That's, uh, that story is you know, it's a great kind of entry point or a little teaser into what we're going to do. More, more or less the same. I mean, I sometimes publish something on Instagram, but as Jeff said, the time is becoming less. At the time I can give to, to this is less and less. So, yeah, but sometimes I try to publish something on Instagram, on Twitter, where you can find some little previews or things like that. And the free comic book day is that that's like an entirely different story, right? It has nothing from the yeah. passageway. Completely a unique, brand new 24 page comic that we did for just, just for that, that, uh, that I don't know how that one's going to be collected. Maybe there might, we discuss possibly doing some other really shorter stories like that and then collecting them into one volume at some point. But for now, that'll just be available through your comic shops. So yeah, it's a, it's a completely unique story. <laughs> That's super exciting. And, uh, I guess that'll be your, our real gateway into the mythos will be yeah. that issue yeah that'll be first and pastry is not long after so yeah those two it's like a one-two punch of the gateway i think <laughs> uh, well we're seeing different aspects of the mythology two, three weeks of difference 
maybe yeah. three weeks. Yeah. Well, uh, Jeff, Andrea, thank you so much for joining us on Comic Book Couples Counseling. Again, a uh, privilege uh, to have you two here. And we're so excited for all the comics that are in our future, let alone your future. <laughs> Thanks. We're excited as well. We're just getting started with this and it's it's gets more exciting the more we do. So um, yeah, we're, we're starting to think ahead to the second year now and getting really excited about those stories. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for having us here as well. Well, you're always welcome back. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. And there you have it, our conversation with Andrea Sorrentino and Jeff Lemire. Pretty incredible. I love those two. Very, very thankful to them for hanging out with us for such a long period of time. I really appreciated how Andrea Sorrentino wanted to force Jeff Lemire into doing a comic that was really horrific. The Bone Orchard mythos is going to be their ultimate horror expression. And meanwhile, like Lemire has been kind of resisting that, which I guess is a little surprising. Some people equate horror with like just it's like guts and skulls and blah, blah, blah. But like to me, Horror is more about like that evocative thing where you feel inside you things like just like being not right, like that feeling of dread or that feeling of just anxiety. Existential crisis. And that has always been inherent in Jeff Lemire's writing. Like I reread Primordial, which is a sci-fi comic, but that element of things being askew is so present yeah. and I think horrifying. Yeah. Yeah. Th that, that, that I primordial is such a good comic. I love it and, so hard, you know, coming off of Gideon falls and going right into primordial, these two, like it did feel like another transitional moment for their relationship. And then what's interesting about the bone orchard is it feels a little bit like a step back into the Gideon Falls world. And mm -hmm. so like it, you don't necessarily see how primordial might inform uh bone orchard mythos. But when you speak about like bodies changing, minds changing, humanity reckoning with its own sense of self, primordial Gideon Falls and the bone orchard really do line up nicely. To me, it sounds like creatively, Jeff Lemire and Andrea Sorrentino want to build a home base that they can return to creatively where they can like, you know, put out a few books, do a few stories and then go off and do their own thing, but then have this space to come back together and collaborate in a way that is infinite. Mm, yeah. I'm very excited to read the prelude on free comic book day and then to get into 10,000 black feathers, knowing that the passageway was not intended to be the start point for this mythos. Or, or the idea that the mythos could really have started anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Anywhere and any time. Mm hmm. Yeah, so I, I I I can't wait until we have like a better picture with all these other pieces because what we get in the passageway is such a tease. Uh, to me, like the thing that I find to be the tease is that they have already planned yeah. things that they are never going to tell us. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. That's torture, and I love it. Don't you want to just kick down the doors of their apartments? Or they're probably homes. I, I'm, sure I'm sure that they have a Google Drive. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. A OneDrive. Uh, yeah, let's kick down the doors of their Google Drive and root around. I bet mm -hmm. you there are some real treasures in there. But I also respect Lemire's desire to, you know, I, uh, I don't like to over-explain things, too. Like, he is a little bit like Lynch that way as well, mm -hmm. where, you know, like, the world Work speaks for itself. It's pure kink. He is withholding. And, <laughs> um, and, and we just keep coming back for more. But our uh, love and thanks go out to them for coming on to Comic Book Couples Counseling and to you, dear listener, for hanging out with us as well. Please share this interview with all your friends and family members. We're really proud of it and we want everyone on this planet to listen to it. And we want everyone on this planet to get into the Bone Orchard mythos. Uh, this is going to be an event series for Lemire and Sorrentino, and I think it's going to attract a lot of new fans. But now we got to get back to our regular lives. What do we have coming up next week? 
Uh, so we have our Saga Volume 9 episode. Mm-hmm. That's our final, our final Marco and Alana session. Mm. Not We're forever, not maybe. There's more. Uh, There's more saga. Is, I mean, there, there will definitely be more saga episodes. Will there be more Marco and Alana episodes? Ah, uh, Lisa, I don't know. Uh, and of course, after that, we have another creator corner with Jeff Smith talking about his new series, Tuki. And yes, of course, we talk a little bone as well. And please, if you're listening to this episode, hit those links in the show notes, head on over to our Patreon feed, check out our creator cranny conversations with Cherish Chen, Rance Hosley, Michael Tanner, and Francois Vigneault. Uh, those are like some like unbelievably compelling conversations. Uh, the Rance Hosley one in particular right now has been like haunting my brain. The conversation that we had around empathy and the role that uh, we as an audience have in embracing perspective, but also the role that publishers and creators have Mm -hmm. in getting the audience to embrace different perspectives. I think it's an important conversation. So please go check that out. That conversation actually brings up a lot of the same themes that come up in my latest YA free period article, Mm. which is actually a print interview with Jadzia Axelrod and Jess Taylor about their new YA graphic novel coming out galaxy, which is about a trans superhero and the idea that like you don't have to be the exact same as the protagonist to relate to them. And actually there are so many shades and colors of relating to a character and and we want every reader to experience all of them. Yeah. That is such a great conversation that you had over at comics book case Uh, link in the show notes to that as well. Uh, Super proud of you. And I like, I've just been glowing in the reception that that interview has had online. Me too. Really proud of you, Lisa. Aw, thanks. I'm blushing my way into our outro. Brad, (laughs) where can our listeners send their words of affirmation to you? You can find me on all social medias at mouth dork. If you have words, of affirmation for our logo you can send them to aaron prescott at a cool hand fluke and if you have some words of affirmation for our radical banner art and show posters send them to karen charm at karen underscore x-men fan lisa where can our listeners send their words of affirmation to you i am always accepting words of affirmation at sidewalk siren on instagram and twitter if you'd like to spend more quality time with us you can subscribe to us on podbean stitcher youtube google and apple podcasts If you'd like to get exclusive, you can join our Patreon, where you'll get more content, including weekly bonus episodes and all of those rad interviews we told you about. Yeah, if you'd like to reach out and touch us electronically, you can email the podcast, cbccpodcast at gmail.com. You can visit our website, comicbookcouplescounseling.com, or follow us on Instagram and Twitter at cbccpodcast. You can give us the gift of five stars on Apple Podcasts, and if you'd like to do an act of service, Why not write a review of the show while you're there? We are fluent and receptive in all five love languages. It really warms our hearts and helps the pod. So until next time, friends, keep your love tank full. And your psychic rapport open. And now we have to go read Saga Volume 9, Lisa.